Hi folks, we're here for lockdown cocktails. We're here for Food Tribe's happy hour. I wasn't here last week, but I'm back again. I was off doing some crazy things with wine yes, last week, but I am back in it with you folks this week, ready for a Friday drink. Switching to Fridays, folks. Hi there, hi. Switching to Fridays, folks, because I'm back at work. <gasps> Out of lockdown and back at work. So Thursdays I am in the office and Fridays I'm working from home. This is the mad world. So yeah, we've switched from Thursday uh, cocktails happy hour to a Friday, which is great. You know, we're all getting back into the swing of things. Hi Ellie. Um, and today in a sort of like semi, semi celebration, I thought we'd do some stuff around bubbles. So everything today is all around bubbles and the joy of bubbles, but not just bubbles like this, although we're definitely gonna do some stuff with some sparkling wine. But I thought I'd take us through three different types of bubbles and the way those three different types of bubbles can make different types of drinks. And I love a bit of bubbliness. So we're gonna go through bubbles in terms of CO2, carbonation, which we love. We love a bit of carbonation and we've got some nice fever tree Mediterranean tonic here. Um, we're going to go through still carbonation, but through a more natural process. And we've got some sparkling wine here from Chapel Down, a Bacchus, which I've never had before. So I'm going to try it for the first time today. But a nice sparkling wine. Hey there, Dan. Um, and then finally, dun, 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 my crazy, crazy contraption, which is my nitrogen siphon. Uh, I'll tell you how you can not need a nitrogen siphon to make this drink as well. So don't worry, it's not you don't need one of these to make it. But we're going to use some nitro cold brew to make the final drink that we're going to have today. So let's get cracking, hey? Bubbles, the joy of bubbles. So you might think bubbles are just uh, a, a sensation. They're just something that feels in the mouth and oh, they're fizzy. But they actually do so much work in a drink and in loads of drinks. If you've ever had flat Coca-Cola, you'll know exactly what I mean. Flat Coca-Cola tastes so much sweeter. There's two reasons why flat Coca-Cola tastes sweeter than, um, than, than its fizzy counterpart. The first is that the carbon dioxide actually creates acid in the mouth. As it breaks down and reacts with what's going on in your mouth, it produces an acid. And that's true of all carbon dioxide. So every time you drink something that's fizzy, you're gonna get that acidity. There's also that textural element, that bursting, that slight pain, like actual pain you're getting, which your, your body receives as a cooling freshness. So bubbles are not just kind of, ooh, it's fizzy. They actually provide really substantial flavor profiles to something. Just making it fizzy can change the entire way something tastes. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more when we come to sparkling wine, because it's really important in sparkling wine. First drink though, we're gonna go really super simple. Um, as, as I've told many of you before, I love a gin and tonic. Gin and tonic is a fantastic drink, but, I also like other stuff with tonics. I thought I'd get on my soapbox, this is my soapbox, it's actually a wine box. I get my soapbox today and tell you just a little bit about other things you can do with tonic. And, and I've pulled out an old favorite now on these things, which is a glass house uh, whiskey, because it's a mixing whiskey, it's designed for mixing, really like this one. Um, and I'm gonna make a whiskey and tonic. Uh, nice drink, very simple, it's as simple as it sounds. But I'm gonna take you through a little bit of how to make something like this really, really good. So hello to everybody joining, nice to see you all. We're talking about bubbles today, bubbly cocktails. Um, and I'm gonna put this in a slightly different glass. So I think if you just use a normal tumbler or a highball glass when you're making uh, something end tonic, when it's not gin and tonic, you, you start, people start expecting a gin and tonic and that's the problem when you put other things with it. We've become so used to gin and tonic that when you taste something like a whiskey and tonic or a brandy and tonic or anything in tonic, your brain doesn't think, hi, happy Friday to everyone, yes, time for some drinks. Your brain thinks it looks for the gin and it can't find it. So one way to try and get people out of that mindset is to serve it to them, serve it to them as a drink and serve it to them in something different. So I'm putting it in this, a nice little champagne flute. And the reason for that is to just break that mental barrier, get people away from the idea that it's gonna taste like a gin and tonic. It's gonna taste great, just not like a gin and tonic. Um, like a gin and tonic, I'm gonna pop a couple of ice cubes into my glass. There we go. So we want it to be nice and cool. And then I'm gonna make this to uh, a, a recipe that I got in a, an 80, uh, 19th century book, which talks about a pony. So a pony is an interesting measurement in, in cocktails. Um, I've got this nice, uh, from Seedlet, this jigger. Now, my usual ones, these are 25 mil, an egg cup, what I use around my house. 
for a pony, you want about 40 mils. So you could go for kind of double this and be a very heavy paw pony, but I'm actually gonna go for a 40 mil paw on one of these, which is just less than, than the top, all the way up to the top here. So the reason I'm doing this is a pony is a good strong amount. It's not quite a double, but it's just shy of, and it's a good amount. And you can see there, with some ice, that really takes you up. And that, great drink, ice, whiskey, what's not to love. Now, I'm gonna add the tonic. Now, I'm gonna measure this as well. So for a good gin and tonic, and I and, and don't know if she's uh, watching, she often does, if Jenny, Jenny is watching, we have had many an argument about this. So, gin and tonic, my view, and it might be controversial is, do not serve it in one of their massive bowls full of ice, I hate it. You're banned from my house if you're gonna do that. Do Please do never serve me a gin and tonic like that. Gin and tonic should be a nice short drink. And the measurement should be one third gin to two thirds tonic. Not a splash of gin, several 150, 600, whatever, you know, an entire bowl of ice which waters down your gin and then tonic water on top of that. You get a watery spirit. So in the spirit of that, we put 40 mils of our whiskey into here. And then we're gonna pop in tonic and I've used a Mediterranean tonic water, uh, calorie free one from Fever Tree. This is my favorite Fever Tree tonic water for everything, uh, but it works particularly well with the whiskey because of the savory kind of herbal notes. It's a bit, a bit lighter and it brings in that savory earthy quality that we get from the whiskey. So this one, the Mediterranean one is particularly good. And we're gonna go two thirds. So we did 40 mils. Now I know measuring out tonic water seems a bit crazy, but it's like any other cocktail. Actually, there is a ratio, and if you get that ratio right, it's a better drink. Now, I'm gonna pause here, two thirds. My wife drinks her, drinks her gin and tonics 50-50, and she would drink anything than tonic. So it's always worth taking a pause and saying, ooh, maybe I'll like it at a 50-50. So we're gonna take that, let's have a little taste. Oh, that's good. I'm gonna add a little bit more tonic. So I want to taste the tonic. I'm actually gonna go there. So, and now you see, now don't serve this to someone and say, oh, it's a whiskey and tonic. Call it something like a whiskey and bitters or a whiskey and bitter soda. And it looks beautiful. And you're not expecting that to taste like a gin and tonic. And that's gonna help. So I'm gonna garnish it in a moment, but just taste it now. And we're gonna talk about the bubbles and why the bubbles are important. So that's delicious. Look. Bitters and whiskey go really well together. Tonic water is delicious and refreshing. So it's like a whiskey and soda, but elevated. And why have I put it in a champagne flute particularly? Well, like champagne, what are these designed to do? They're designed for the carbon dioxide in the glass to pop and then get captured in this little tulip shape here. So when you put your nose to it, you get all those smells. So these are actually really great glasses to serve any carbonated cocktail in because you're gonna get that, that, um, that real aromatic flavors from it. And particularly, if you're gonna use a nice whiskey like we have with the glass house here, when you add that effervescence, when you add the carbon dioxide in the, soda, in the, in the, from, from the tonic water, it's now gonna really bring out all of the aromatics from the whiskey. So when you bring it up to your mouth, you're getting all those really aromatic, which with the glass house is orchard fruits. So you get a lot of apple and a lot of pear. So that's what I'm gonna to choose to, to garnish this with. And look, I've shown off my knives before on, on, on uh, the Food Tribe Happy Hour. And I'm gonna show this one off. You do not need to use a knife like this. This is gratuitous. I am just showing off my knife, but a lot of people said they really liked my Damascus steel knife. This is my other Damascus steel knife. So this is my Damascus steel cleaver, which I absolutely love. This is my Christmas present. So I'm gonna take this and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a nice slice of a nice conference pear um, and I'm gonna take this nice and thin. And this works really well with the glass house whiskey, but with any kind of space side or light whiskey, anything where you're getting fruitiness and sweet, particularly what we call orchard fruits, um, the pear works really well. And there's a few things you can do with this. Um, if you get it right, which I didn't, you can just pop it in and it'll hold itself there. You can just drop it in, of course you can, but I actually think it's quite nice, and can I do this right? We make, our, we make a nice cup in our pear, slide it down, and there you go. I mean, pear works wonderfully. It's actually a really beautiful drink. No one's gonna expect 
that that is going to be tasting like a gin and tonic. And when they say, you say oh, I'll make you a drink, it's refreshing, oh, it's whiskey based, great. And they'll sip it and they'll go, oh, this is really refreshing, I'm really enjoying it in this sunshine. Oh, and the orchard fruit. And it's nice, and they're going to pop that in, because you can't drink it with that, what am I doing? And the orchard fruit brings out those orchard fruit flavours and the carbon dioxide makes it go in your nose. And then you say, oh yeah, it's tonic. And they go, oh, of course it is. Of course it's tonic water. But they're not expecting it to be the gin and tonic. So that's our first bubbles in a bubbles glass. Why do we serve it in a champagne flute? Because that's going to make it taste better because we're going to get more of that aromatic flavour. Mmm. I could drink those all day. Really big recommendation. Remember, if you want to stop at a 50-50, fine. If you want to go up to two-thirds, that's what that one is, nice and refreshing, great. Don't put it in a big bowl. Don't put 18 cubes of ice in it. No one needs that. It's not good for anyone. I'm going to eat this piece of pear. So, 10 minutes in, folks. One drink down. I'll keep sipping on that. We're going to move to our second drink. Now, this drink is my wife's favourite cocktail that I make for her. I made it for her last weekend, and I thought, I'm going to share it with people. It's sort of stolen from Brown's, the restaurant. Um, she took a photo of a drink, kind of tried to describe to me what, we, what it was, and this is what we've, over time, managed to cobble together. Um, I've got to grab one thing from the freezer before we have this. So you entertain yourselves for approximately 15 seconds. So what I've grabbed from the freezer there is a few frozen black currants. It can be black currants or blackberries. And we're going to start this drink by popping those into a champagne coupe. So we had a champagne flute for our first drink. Very nice, concentrates the flavours. Mm -hmm. Just have another sip. Really gives us that aromatic. The other way you can serve it is in a champagne coupe like this. So the champagne coupe does a similar thing, it's still playing with the bubbles, it's trying to give you a nice big surface area into which you can, you can get those things. It doesn't work as well as the flute, effectively, but it's also just a beautiful glass of surfacing. But we can pop our fro about four frozen blackcurrants or one frozen blackberry in the bottom of that glass. It is important that it's frozen, this doesn't work with fresh ones. What you need is the frozen fruit, because what's going to happen is when we make this drink, it's going to burst all of that fruit and it's going to change the colour, which is going to be really important. So, start building this drink. It's a gin-based drink, um, and I'm going to be using a, um, a rhubarb gin that I've made myself. Now, if you don't have rhubarb gin, a couple of things you can do. You can go on the Food Tribe website and you can find my instructions for making rhubarb cordial. If you're doing that, you want to add one measure of gin to half a measure of rhubarb cordial. Really easy to make, all you need is sugar and rhubarb and an hour, and you've got rhubarb cordial, it's cracking. Look it up on the Food Tribe website. If you've made rhubarb gin, you can use it now. Now this is my very special instant rhubarb gin. If you go on my Instagram, you'll see how to make that, which is making use of this, my beautiful, beautiful nitrogen siphon. Um, you can make it instantly. You basically put gin, a bit of sugar, and, and shredded rhubarb into a nitrogen siphon, charge it up, boom, instant rhubarb gin. It's beautiful, it's pink, and it's sweet, and it's delicious. So I've got my rhubarb gin here, or you can use rhubarb cordial and things. If you don't, can't find any rhubarb, or it's not your thing, just normal gin works really well in this drink, but maybe add a splash of some sort of fruit cordial that you like. It's not going to harm it. Play with it yourselves and see what you like. So we're going to take one measure of the rhubarb gin. It's not a very, well, I suppose it is a strong drink. I forgot about the wine we're about to put in it. Pop that into our mixer. Fantastic. Um, and then we're going to take two measures of apple juice. So you want a cloudy apple juice. You don't want that from concentrate, a nice fresh pressed apple juice. Um, and then you can have it in the mornings. Hi to those people just joining. We are doing a whole session today about bubbles, exciting bubbles. We just talked about carbon dioxide in, in fizzy drinks and how that can really bring out something like whiskey. And now we're gonna make my wife's favorite drink, which is a rhubarb royale, is what we call it in our house. Um, and then I'm gonna put two measures, so a one to two ratio of the rhubarb gin to fresh cloudy apple juice which is really nice and you want the cloudy so the drink isn't clear which some people have an issue with 
but I think it's great. I think it works really well. Um, so you pop those in there. Now, um, you want to add a couple of pieces of ice to your, uh, to your jam jar in this instance, or your shaker, because we want to chill this down. We want to bring the temperature down, and we want to dilute it a little bit. So we're just going to give that a stir. Now, you don't need any sugar in this drink, partly because the rhubarb gin itself is quite sweet, because we do put sugar in that, but also because the apple is bringing the sugar. Um, and, as we'll discover in a moment, the wine brings some sugar too. So we're going to stir that for about 15 to 20 seconds. Give it a little taste. It should taste fresh and appley, and then just at the end should have a bit of the rhubarb, but not kick you in the face with the gin. It's a really gentle afternoon sipping drink. Then I'm going to take this, the beautiful Chapel Down Bacchus. Now Bacchus, really interesting grape. Very British grape. You find it in a lot of English wines. Chapel Down, of course, is one of the beautiful English wine producers we have here in the UK. Uh, you can get their kind of sparkling wine that's like a tr traditional champagne method. I've drunk that a lot. I'm a really big fan of it. This one, I've never had. Um, so this is their Bacchus sparkling wine. Um, and I'm really excited to have it. I've literally never even had Bacchus before. I've been reading about the grape today, and it's got a relation, it's got a history around the Riesling grape and those German grape varieties, but it, it uh, matures really early. So um, it grows well in the UK, where we don't necessarily have long hot summers, or we didn't used to. So it's a really good grape for the UK, which is fantastic. Um, and it's got a really characterful flavor, apparently. I'm yet to try it, so we're, we're gonna try it with you today. Um, but I've been told it really has lots of elderflower, lots of kind of apples and lots of flavours that doesn't make refined wines necessarily, but makes really delicious hot weather drinking wines. So let's see if we get a big pop with this and I'll try not to put a hole in my ceiling because my wife won't be happy with that. Beautiful. And then we see the lovely clouds of carbon dioxide coming out as it sublimes, as it changes from a gas to a solid uh, instantly without becoming a liquid. There's a bit of GCSE chemistry for you there. It's one of the few things that does it. It turns from one state to another without passing through the third state of matter. Um, and we're gonna have a little taste of this. I didn't grab a glass for myself. Bear with me a moment, folks. So I'm gonna take a champagne flute. Sparkling wine is the best way to taste it. I'm gonna give myself a little bit of this. Always good to taste it. Now, if you can't get hold of Chapel Down Bacchus, which would be reasonable, although they do sell it in Waitrose, it's only uh, £10 at the moment, this bottle. Um, oh, that's fantastic. Uh, a Prosecco works really well. Don't waste champagne on this. You, you'd be throwing money away if you put a champagne in this. So this is a really good one to use for it because of those elderflower, oh, fantastic elderflower and fruit notes. That is fab, folks. That is absolutely fab. That, in a park, socially distancing with your mates, go get this. It's, it's so cheap for what it is. You'd be paying so much money for that um, if you got it. Chill it down, have it in the sunshine, it's going to be cracking. It's going to be cracking in this drink as well. So we've chilled down our uh, rhubarb gin, and we've chilled down it with our apple juice. And then we take our champagne coupe, like this, and you can see we've got our black currants in there. They're frozen black currants. And remember, frozen is important. Now, we're going to add um, our thing. So I'm just going to lightly put my, you know, the old pasta trick, and I'm just going to pour in and not put the ice in. If you're out in a garden party, maybe leave the ice in just to keep it chilled. But if you're inside the house, you don't need to do that. So I'm just using the lid to stop the ice from coming through. It's a nice trick when you use a jam jar. It makes life easy. And you can see there, the black currants have started to burst and they're bringing a nice pinkness to that, which is nice because you've told people that it's rhubarb, but actually the rhubarb doesn't give it much color at all. So the pinkness comes from, from those blackberries or black currants that are frozen and it needs to be frozen. Now this is where you eyeball it. I like this drink quite dry, so I add quite a lot of wine. And my wife likes it quite sweet, so we only put a splash in for her. And here's the thing. This wine actually has quite a high sugar content, as does Prosecco, as does Champagne. And people who say, I don't like sweet wine, I don't even like semi-sweet wine, will like a Champagne, will like a Prosecco, and will like probably a sparkling Bacchus. See there, I've just added a good glug. Beautiful drink, fill it right up. And we've got this light effervescence now. And it's not fully the fizzy drink, so it's not a fizzy cocktail, not as fizzy as our 
our, our whiskey and tonic down there. We've got a light effervescence and we get a lot that surface area and it's just fizzing up the apple. And the, the dryness of the Bacchus with its elderflower kick is really sitting well with that. This is a really elegant drink to just to serve. And as I say, I kind of stole it from Browns, but not really because I didn't ever see the recipe. So this is just kind of from my wife's memory. We reckon it's about right. So the thing about um, sparkling wine is it's actually quite sweet. But the carbon dioxide, as we said before, does two things. Just being fizzy makes your brain go, oh, this is cooling and drying and fresh because of the texture, the bubbles breaking in your mouth is sharp, which reminds you of acids. But it also has carbon dioxide, which reacts with things in your mouth. And as it breaks down, it produces acids. So it actually is sourer, it's drier. It gives you that kind of acidity that balances the sweetness. So what you often find is in sparkling wines are actually a lot more sweet than you'd expect. And if you let them go flat, you'll taste, if you taste a flat champagne, it tastes incredibly sweet. So they actually work really well in a cocktail and they don't make, they're not too dry, they don't sit against it. This is a fab drink. So just to recap on what this drink is, we're gonna have, we take some um, rhubarb gin, this was the homemade rhubarb gin. If you don't have rhubarb gin, don't worry. Just use normal gin and any kind of fruit cordial. If you can get rhubarb cordial, fantastic. In that case, one measure of normal gin to half a measure of some sort of fruit cordial. So we take rhubarb gin, one measure of rhubarb gin, 25 mils, and then we're gonna have 50 mils or a one to two, because you could double this up if you wanted, of nice cloudy apple juice. Please don't use that kind of like, looks like piss, from concentrate apple juice. It will not be good in this. You really need the cloudy, fresh pressed apple juice. It makes a big difference. Please use that. So you pop that in there and you put that, stir it for 15 seconds with ice just to bring the temperature down and chill it nicely. And then you're gonna pour it over frozen, either black currants or blackberries, it has to be frozen. The reason it has to be frozen is that it will then pop when they meet that warmer liquid and you get their beautiful color, just making a slight pinkness to this drink. Then take something, this, I would highly recommend, folks, Chapel Down Bacchus. This is not a paid promotion or anything. I just picked it up in Waitrose today and really wanted to try it, and it's really nice. Um, if you want to do a paid promotion, please send me wine, Chapel Down. I'll be very happy. Um, but it's beautiful, and I really love using English sparkling wine. English sparkling wine is absolutely fantastic. Uh, we produce some of the best sparkling wine in the world, and we really should shout about it. We should say how good that is. Um, and it's delicious on its own which I really like, but we put a, a splash in. I'd say it's probably about 50 to 60 mils, but if you prefer it with more of the wine, put more. If you want less of the wine, put less. And what you get is this beautiful drink, which is lightly effervescent. You've got the rhubarb, you've got the apple, you've got elderflower flavors from that English sparkling wine, the Bacchus grape. As I say, if you can't get hold of that, don't worry, Prosecco works really well. Don't be putting champagne in this, there's absolutely no point. So technically it's not a Royale, because a Royale should in the world, proper world of cocktails, should have champagne in it. But I don't think anyone cares. I think when we say champagne, we just mean sparkling wine. And if you can get sparkling wine for 10 quid that's grown in the UK, do that, support some local producers. All right, this is fab, folks. I am super enjoying today's session because that is a cracking drink. Okay, so we're, we're running ahead of time today a little bit. So I'm gonna take a moment I'm gonna sip on these two drinks and just see, does anybody have any questions about bubbles? Maybe about English bubbles, um, anything about that kind of weird chemistry that I've been talking about in terms of why things take, taste fresher? It's one of the reasons um, why if people like soda water, I really do. If I've had a really long session at the gym, what I want is, is soda water out of a can and I find it so much more refreshing, seltzer water. Um, and that's because it is, it genuinely is more refreshing because it is more acidic. It has that freshness and your brain reads those kind of popping bubbles in your mouth as, as refreshing. So it's not just a, a crazy preference. It does actually make a difference that, that soda water, fizzy water tastes fundamentally different to water out of your tap. And if you let it go flat, it still tastes different. It tastes kind of horrible at that point because what you're getting then is kind of the dissolved carb calcium carbonate, which is what they basically used to do it. Um, I don't have a soda stream, but if you have a soda stream, that's what, that's what they're doing. They're just adding the carbon dioxide to it, dissolving it into, into the water. So is, and what are other people drinking today? If you want to say hi to all those people joining, send me some things. What are you having on a Friday in your happy hour? Here in lockdown, in semi-lockdown, however the world is, 
um, for you at the moment. Um, I'm back at work, which is mad, which is partly why I'm kind of semi-celebrating with some sort of bubbles, but we'll see. Hi there to Tom, who's just joined. Um, and we're going to talk about the next drink. So for the next drink, I'm going to move away from carbon dioxide. <gasps> Shock and horror. That's the, the bubbles we're all majorly used to. I'm just going to have another sip of this wonderful whiskey and tonic. So for many years, carbon dioxide is our primary drink bubble. It's what makes champagne fizzy. It's what makes carbonated drinks fizzy. It's what makes beer fizzy. It's what makes bread r rise, folks. Carbon dioxide is easy to produce because living beings produce carbon dioxide. That means that you can, you can produce carbon dioxide very easily with yeast. You can produce it with, with plants. It's really easy to get carbon dioxide. So that is what most fizziness comes from. Now, the next bubble I'm going to talk about is not carbon dioxide. It's actually nitrogen. So I've got here my nitrogen siphon. These are not super expensive pieces of kit. They're about 30 quid. Um, and you just need to buy these wonderful things, which are uh, nitrous oxide. So wonderful little things. Now, and you see these. You see these all over the streets of London. And so all I can assume folks, all I'm going to assume is that there's lots of kind of pastry chefs wandering around London late at night with a late night pastry chef uh, scene where they're taking nitrogen and they're making wonderful whipped cream desserts, spumas, foams, or indeed nitro coffee as I am. Because otherwise, why is there just all of these nitrogen canisters everywhere? Who knows? Who knows indeed, folks? But I'm going to use it to make nitro coffee. You might have seen this. There's a few companies making nitro coffee now. One is called Minor Figures. So you don't need to have a nitrogen siphon, although they're only about 30 quid if you like having a play. Um, and as I've said earlier, they're actually really useful for making infused uh, spirits. So you can use them to make uh, infused gins, vodkas, you can make beautiful coffee rum using them, it's fab. So actually I would say, there's Cakesmith, hey Andrew. Oh, he's going to say hello to us, okay. Andrew, say hello folks. Go waiting for him. Um, you can make all sorts of infusions with it. So if you do want to spend 30 quid on one, they're not crazy expensive and they're not insane pieces Hello. of... Hello, Andrew, you've joined us at the opportune moment. I'm just going to move my uh, screen a little bit because you can't see my face. Um, because I've just got out my fancy piece of kit. Do oh, you know what it is, Andrew? Your, um, oh, your nitrous thing. This is my nitrogen siphon. Um, and I was just saying to everyone, you know, you see these all over the street. You see them all over London. All I can assume is that there's lots of pastry chefs doing a late night pastry chef scene and on the streets of London, right? Undercover pastry, it's a thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I get into this scene, but but I'll have to work it out. Um, so yeah, they're only about 30 quid. But if you're not fancying buying yourself a nitrogen siphon just to make nitro coffee, um, you can buy it. It's fairly easy. There's a few of the major brands do it. Nescafe do it. Um, I think Kenko do one, and the one I would recommend, the one I think is good and it's smaller and it's independent, is Minor Figures, and they've got some cool like drawings on them. So minor Figures are great, and um, just get their plain nitro coffee, and that will work for this cocktail, absolutely no problem. So Andrew, how are you doing? Are you I'm, drinking I'm something good, nice? Thanks. I'm good, thanks. I've I've just got off another call, so I'm not I'm not drinking today, unfortunately. But I, I missed the boat. What are you What are you shaking? What's in the siphon? So we'll just do a little recap before we make our final drink then. So we've been talking about bubbles today. Because I'm sort of back at work. I'm sort of semi-back at work. So I'm kind of, I'm in a celebratory mood. So I thought, let's do a bubble session. So we started talking purely about injected carbon dioxide. So unnatural dissolved carbon dioxide. And we talked about tonic water. So what we did is we have a lovely whiskey and tonic. And what we talked about here was, if you're going to serve something other than gin with tonic, don't put it in a normal gin and tonic glass. Serve it in a bit of a fancy way. Put it in a champagne flute. You know, we've got a nice slice of pear in here as our government. Nice. Um, just because otherwise people expect a gin and tonic. And if you expect a gin and tonic and then it doesn't taste like it, you go, oh, I don't like that. Whereas if I say, oh, I've got a lovely drink for you, it's whiskey based, you'll like it, it's really refreshing. Here you go, in a champagne glass. You, your brain doesn't automatically expect the gin. A W and T. And so that was our artificially added where we dissolved carbon dioxide into a pressurized tonic. 
Very delicious, nice. lovely. And it really brings out kind of for all spirits, gin included, but also whiskey, brings out a lot of the aromatics, which is great. Also a good reason to put it in a champagne flute because it's designed to give you that aromatics. We then made Kate, my wife, who Andrew knows very well, of course, and um, we made her favorite cocktail, which is a rhubarb. And Andrew and I, both big rhubarb fans, um, an apple and rhubarb royale, uh, which is rhubarb gin, couple of measures of um, apple juice, uh, nice cloudy apple juice. And we used a Bacchus sparkling wine, a very British sparkling wine with a, with a grape variety that is very specifically British. Um, it, it does grow elsewhere in the world. It originates in Germany, but it, it really matures early in the season, which makes it great for British growers because it, they can actually get wine out of it. Chapel Down, fantastic producer. Um, and that's natural CO2. So we got our bubbles from natural CO2, the yeast in yeast. the wine. You're a big mm-hmm. yeast fan, Tom. I am a yeast fan. That is tr- Andrew knows me very well. Have you told everyone I, they can grow their own yeast tree at home? You can go to my Instagram. You can work out how to grow your own yeast tree. Got a few of you with that one, didn't I? Um, so, yeah, we, we talked about natural bubbles, which are coming from a natural fermentation from yeast, and that produced our beautiful little royale. So we just top up that, um, uh, that, that rhubarb gin and the apple with the wine. Beautiful. And we talked there about how actually fizzy wines are actually very sweet. There are a lot of sugar in them. But the, the, the way that bubbles interact in the mouth creates both an acid from the reactions with the dissolved carbon dioxide with the chemicals in your mouth, but also the sensation, the physical sensation of bubbles popping in your mouth. Your brain interprets that as cold as fresh and as a result it makes everything feel lighter even when it's got quite a lot of sugar in it and then and as you join us andrew we have moved (laughs) fancier sorts of bubbles hipster bubbles I'm back. So I'm we've back. got my terrible cold brew. It's terrible. Right. So we've got our cold brew coffee. If you want to make cold brew coffee, folks, super easy. Get a cafetiere, three spoons of coffee into your cafetiere, fill it up with tap water, leave it overnight, plunge down your cafetiere. There you've got cold brew. Brew. Really easy. Pop it in a bowl. Anything. Great. It kicks like a mule. So cold brew has more caffeine in it than probably any other sort of coffee. And there's a reason for that. Andrew, do you know the reason for that? It's just because it's, uh, well, I was going to say, if you're doing that, then it's just got an extended amount of time to infuse for the caffeine to be drawn out. True. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a question. And because you're clever, you're going, to, you're going to see the trick in my question and answer it correctly. But I'm going to ask you, what do you think has more caffeine in it? An espresso or a cup of filter coffee? I'm going to say a cup of filter coffee. I'm assuming it's something to do with the extraction or the temperature. You're quite right. It is. It is. It's a cup of filter coffee. So filter coffee actually can have up to twice the amount of caffeine that an espresso has in it. And the reason for that is um, caffeine dissolves in water over time. So if you imagine an espresso takes roughly 30 seconds to make. So you extract loads of flavor. You extract the flavor and the really complex and very volatile chemicals really well, which is why espresso is beautiful and floral and and wonderful. And you get that crema, the fats that sit on top of it. Beautiful. Extracts those really well. But actually, it's not sat in the water for very long. And the water is steam. So the caffeine doesn't have a lot of time to to dissolve and and end up in your eventual liquid. Whereas in a filter coffee, it's sat there for maybe three to ten minutes particularly if that's been sat on a pot like in one of those American ones. So loads of caffeine has chance to dissolve into it. Um, and then and it, it's nearly twice as strong. And that's not by volume. That's if you make an Americano out of an espresso, so you have the same volume, the filter coffee will be twice as strong in some cases. Wow. Cold brew is even stronger than that because you've left it for maybe 24 hours and that cold extraction of the, the coffee produces beautiful flavors, but it also produces a bam, kick in the face of caffeine. You need to go easy. You need to go easy. Or, as I have done, use decaf. 
because decaf is fine, folks. And if you're like me and you can't drink coffee after 2 p.m. because it keeps you up all night and you're an old person, you need your sleep, go for this. So what I've done is I made my cold brew, popped it into my nitrogen siphon. I'm going to give it a, a, a wee shake. And as I say, you can buy this stuff. So if you want to buy it, that's no problem. We're still going to make the cocktail. So then I've taken my capsule of nitrogen, popped it into its little thing, and I'm just going to screw this in. And it's going to infuse my coffee with nitrogen. And there we go. Can you, get, can you only get a single use out of that canister for that can, Tom? You absolutely can, so it doesn't reseal. Um, and it's really important. Some some recipes you'll find online, hey, Selassie, how are you doing? We're doing fancy nitrogen things because I'm a dirty, dirty hipster. Um, you, you, you'll see some recipes online that tell you to do stuff like double charge your nitrogen siphon where you use two of the capsules. Do not do that because I'm going to tell you from experience that this coming off the top at pressure is very, very, very dangerous. So don't do that. Just use one. And if, if the recipe says two, do one, let the gas come out, then do it again. So if you can give that a shake. Love Selassie, gas. Thanks. Selassie, loves gas. Selassie knows why all these, these uh, nitrogen canisters are everywhere, because Selassie's a trained pastry chef. So maybe Selassie knows why these are all over the streets of London. I'm assuming it's because people are having like bake-offs in the street late at night, like Fast and Furious, but with pastry. That's where all the flour's been going as well, so it all adds up, Tom. Adds up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that white powder I find all over the street in Stratford. That's what that is. Great. So once you put your nitrogen in, you've got to give it a really good shake. And the reason for that is we are just dissolving, literally dissolving the nitrogen into the coffee. Now, we don't have to worry about a change of flavor in this because nitrogen is one inert. of a very, very inert class. It's one of the noble gases, is it, Andrew? Very noble. It's a noble gas. It doesn't react with anything else. It's not in any way dangerous, um, but don't inhale it, um, I would say. <laughs> but it's not going to affect the flavor. It's very inert. It's food grade. And it's not going to change the flavor of our coffee at all. But it, it does need to dissolve into it. Cause it's not going to react in any way. So that's now dissolved. It's shaken up. I shake it. Actually, I always shake it 23 times. Um, but you don't need to do that. This time, something. Um, only love thanks to spreading and sharing positivity during. Good. Thank you. We love love. Right. So... I'm going to make this in a nice little tumbler glass. I'm going to start by putting some ice into that. This is an iced coffee drink. Really nice for the afternoon. Uh, if you've had a, a hard day, you can have it in the morning. I'm not going to judge. Have it in the morning. I, I wish you were my personal bartender, Tom. I know. It's great. Um, so what I'm going to start with is I'm, I'm using this beautiful, and this is the, the pairing that I've gone for. I'm using a sweet vermouth. You can use any red vermouth. I'm using this one, which I keep showing on this show, in the hope that discarded spirits will say to me, we love you, Tom. Thanks for showing us. Here's a free bottle. They haven't done so yet, but I'm still going to promote it. So discarded spirits is great. Um, this is a vermouth made from the outside, the cherry, what's called the cascara fruit of coffee beans. So it works really well with the coffee flavor. So highly, highly recommend. It's sweet vermouth, though. So if you use any of the red vermouths, any sweet vermouth, that'll work really well. This one's particularly nice, it's really fruity. So I'm gonna put a single measure of that, uh, so 25 mils, into the bottom of my glass. That's really delicious. Oh, lovely. Now, that on its own, great drink. Coffee and vermouth. Trust me, it works. Um, and then, um, but I'm gonna add it, I'm gonna kick it up a notch, I'm gonna make it a bit stronger. And I've got this lovely, uh, this lovely rum. Uh, it's a dark rum. Um, I think this is made by Havana Club, weirdly, but it's one of Havana Club's um, kind of like artisanal range. Uh, and this is um, this is matured in Sauterne barrels, so it's matured in, in dirt wine barrels, which gives it a lovely sweet caramel flavour. Um, and we're going to put a single measure of this, so a single measure of sweet vermouth and a single measure of a dark rum. Has to be a dark rum, folks. Don't put white rum in this. It will not be pleasant. Cool. So we're going to give that a wee little stir. Just in the bottom of our. Tom, a question: Are we yeah. expecting this? Because I'm trying to work out whether I'm expecting this to be foamy when it comes out of your siphon, or just frothy. So we're going to see. We're going to see. It does something special. So I'm going to bring it close to the camera. But think Guinness. That's all I'm going to say. Right. Okay. So in here, 
we've got a measure of sweet vermouth and a measure of dark rum. Why is Andrew, why isn't Andrew making it at the same time? Mainly because Andrew didn't know I was making it. And also because he doesn't have anything. He's just come off a call, whereas I, I do this all the time because Andrew doesn't have quite the same problems I have. Right. Okay. So you've got the glass here. I've got my siphon, turned it upside down. I've got my trigger ready. It's over a laptop. Let's hope I don't destroy my laptop. Yeah, easy does it, Tom. We're start extruding our coffee. Ooh. Whoa. It's got some pressure. Wow. Don't expect it to be that pale coming out. No, and that's because that's all the bubbles. So we're just going to... You've got to be a little bit careful. That you don't jet it out the top. Ooh. Exactly. I'm just going to release that a little bit, make it a little bit easier. Um, so the Thomas thing about yikes. coffee is... <laughs> move it a little bit away from the laptop. Science lab moment with Tom. Wow, look at that. So the thing about coffee is you forget that it has fat in it. So that crema that we have on the top of an espresso is actually fat. And so what you get is this beautiful head on the top of this. And this will go down, so we, it, and it doesn't last very long. That's going to go everywhere. Well, actually, Tom, it didn't go everywhere. And Ellie, it didn't go everywhere. It <laughs> went a bit on my laptop, but I don't work for that company anymore, so that's fine. Um, so, you, and you get this kind of thing. So serve them quickly, and you can always top up with a little bit more coffee. I'm going to come back around here. And if you don't have the ice and you don't have the spirits in, and you're just making a cold brew nitro coffee, it'll fizz up and it'll actually look like a Guinness and you'll see a beautiful kind of thing. The ice does just make it um, set a little bit more. But that's kind of what you want. About halfway so, Tom, through. Question, what would have happened yeah. if you'd put all the ingredients, so the rum, the vermouth, and the coffee into your siphon and then siphoned everything over the ice? So that would have actually been really good. And there's two reasons I didn't do it. So hey, no problem if you want to do that. Hey, Candice. Hey, team. I like it. We're a drinking team. Andrew's, Candice is definitely a drinking team. Candice owns a pub, which I've still yet, yet to be to. My plan was to go to Candice's amazing pub um, in Evershot when, in the beautiful summer, but we have been in lockdown. So as soon as we're free, I'm going to go there. Uh, is it just cold brew? Any sugar added in the can? No, no sugar. So I could have added the stuff into the can and put it in, and that would have been great. And if I'm doing cocktails for other people, that's probably the best way to do it. Two reasons I didn't do it. One, I wanted people to see, be able to see that they can make this drink. Just because I've got a nitrogen siphon doesn't mean you can't make this drink. Just go buy a can of cold brew nitro coffee. It's really easy to get hold of. So I wanted to make it in a way that, that folks could make at home. The other reason is I'm probably going to have one of these drinks and then I'm going to not drink it. So actually now I've got some cold brew for the weekend. And you can store this in a nitrogen siphon. It'll happily sit here for days, days and days and days. Um, and so I can just have a little glass of cold brew whenever I fancy it. And um, so there is no sugar added to mine. Um, if you're just making cold brew coffee and using a nitrogen siphon and you want to have sugar in it, pop some sugar in when it's in the nitrogen siphon. Make sure it's fully dissolved, though. If you have chunks of sugar in there, it's going to block up your siphon and it's going to be a nightmare. So don't do that. Well, you should and do meringues in a siphon. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if you or put it into or put it in there. Now, again, if you like it, it's only for you, go for it. But actually, you might want to think about if you've got made a, a half litre of nitrous coffee. If you drink a half litre of cold brew nitro coffee, you're going to die. So don't do that. If it's, if it's uh, decaf, that's fine. You can do that. Um, so I've, just, I've let that go down. You see, that's fine. This is delicious. So what we get there is a little bit of the rum, a little bit of that sweetness. But nitro coffee, let's talk about that. Why on earth would we make nitro coffee? And I've actually got, I've got a spare glass here. I'm just going to show you into the champagne flute, the nitro coffee, on its own, without anything. There we go. So I always say to people, don't wait for it to settle. Get your nose in this. Get your nose in. Get it. <sighs> Get it dunked. Oh, I'm feeling a bit lightheaded. I don't know why. Um, so why would we make nitro coffee? What's the point of this? Other than that it makes a bit fizzy. Because the thing is, you've got my drink here. That is not fizzy anymore. 
absolutely no fizz to it. This is not carbon dioxide. Also, Tom, brief point. Is it yeah. nitrogen or is it nitrous oxide? Subtle difference about the level of inertness. That's a good question. Uh, let me get the box. <laughs> Right, we've got the we've got the official box. They're Austrian, so you know they're high quality. Right. Duh, 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 duh. Right, what are we? Contents. Pure nitrous oxide. It is <laughs> pure nitrous oxide. So not quite Ooh. as inert as you might think. Not quite as inert as you might think. Maybe it has some effects on brain chemistry. So why would we bother putting nitrous oxide into, into a coffee? What's the point? Because it's now not fizzy here. So there's two things it does. When nitrous oxide is, is in there, it's going to really intensify the way that the chemicals in the coffee dissolve into the water. So I talked before about how I made my rhubarb gin by putting rhubarb and sugar into the nitrogen canister and then charging it up and then just pouring it out. So the nitrogen does two things. It creates a huge amount of pressure and it rips into the cell walls of any kind of vegetable cells that are sitting in that solution. So coffee is a solution. That's what it is. It's a solution of kind of whatever's in the coffee sitting in water. And when you charge it up into the nitrogen canister, the, the, the experience you get from cold brew from any form of coffee intensifies. So what you get is a much deeper solution. And the flavors you should expect from that nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogenifying, nitrogenifying, there's a word there that I can't remember, is a sweeter coffee. So you'll have none of the bitterness. So if you hate coffee, cold brew, nitrogenized, that's the word I was looking for, is a much sweeter, much smoother flavor. Someone said, what's the difference between nitrogen and nitrogen oxide? Uh, ask Can you your answer local that? healthcare professional. <laughs> <laughs> we breathe nitrogen a lot of the time every day, and we're fairly normal. I, I don't know what would happen if you had the rest of it, but no. I know that it's very good for using in a siphon. It's great for using in a siphon. And it makes incredible custards, is all I would say. If you want to put a custard in a nitrogen siphon, and I particularly, there's a, there's a great recipe I came up with, um, which is... Uh, a Lafroig custard. I don't know if Slassy's still watching us, but we had a we had a pudding off. We had a we had a competition about making a spotted dick, um, and I beat him. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, and, we, and I beat him because of my Lafroig infused, so whiskey infused custard, which I nitrogenified. And the thing was, when you ate my custard, which was infused with nitrous oxide, you felt amazing. I don't know why. Um, so the, um, the, the drink we've got here, that sweetness, that smoothness that you get from, from infusing with the nitrous oxide, which really just pummels all the cells that are saying, you do love the pride. Selassie and I, kindred spirits in whiskey, whiskey and tonic here for you, Selassie. When you can, when you can come and visit me again, we'll have a whiskey and tonic together. So that, that, in, that smashing up of the, of the cell walls, which really brings out all the flavors of the coffee but in a sweet way, in a fruity way, really works with the rum, the sweetness, the smoothness of the aged rum, and the fruitiness of a sweet vermouth. So what you get is this beautiful chilled drink. It's actually really refreshing because it's fruity and smooth. It's not bitter at all. And it's a good kind of evening alternative, especially if you use, um, if you use the decaffeinated coffee like I did. I'm hoping this was decaffeinated, otherwise I'm going to be bouncing all over the room. Uh, and ginger, I missed that slassy thing there. So a really said, cracking uh, way. You're a very sexy man, Tom, the way that you're swirling that coffee and just, I think he's talking about your mastery of flavor. And, and you're a ginger. Well, I'm no master compared to Selassie. Selassie is, Selassie is the master and we, we all bow down before his, his mastery. I'm gonna have to dash off here, Tom. Goodbye to Andrew. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna bring through. I'm going to say goodbye to Andrew and then I'm gonna, would Brandy work with it? Yes, Brandy would work with it. Um, absolutely. Um, any kind of dark spirit. So whiskey would work uh, a little bit less well just because it's got a kind of rougher flavor to it. So rum and brandy are really perfect. Armagnac, great. Um, Calvados works incredibly well with the coffee. So I'm just going to run us through really quickly through what we've done today. And then I'm going to say goodbye, folks. So 
We started off with looking at artificial carbonated bubbles. So that was our tonic water. And the little tips here we said is serve it in. Hi there, so much fun. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So we serve it in a champagne flute, one, because it makes people not think about gin and tonic and therefore they don't get help hung up on the fact it doesn't taste like a gin and tonic. So we had our whiskey and tonic with a nice slice of pear. Delicious. Then we moved on to our natural carbon dioxide bubbles that we see in our champagne and sparkling wines. And we used a Bacchus, an English grape, an English sparkling wine from Chapel Down. Absolutely fantastic sparkling wine. And we popped that with rhubarb gin, apple juice, and some frozen black currants. Delicious, smooth drink. My wife's favorite cocktail. And then we went crazy and we had Andrew join us for our scientific moment. And we were talking about nitrous oxide. We got our nitrogen siphon out. Um, with our cold brew nitro coffee, which is sweet and luscious because the nitrogen pulls out all the sweet and fruity flavors in the coffee without bringing out the bitter edge that you get from a quick um, dilution of coffee from boiling water. Um, and we mix that with uh, one part sweet vermouth and one part rum. Delicious, smooth, sweet flavors bringing out all those fruity notes. And we just used our beautiful nitrogen siphon. I'm going to give you one last puff on our nitrogen siphon. I'm just going to dilute this down a little bit. Remember, I use decaf, but you can use main coffee. And you get that beautiful foamy head from our nitrogen, which also adds a really nice smoothness to this drink. So that's the vermouth and the rum and the coffee. Folks, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today. Um, keep yourself safe. The world's changing. There's lots going on in the world, so keep informed and, and make sure that uh, you are staying safe and you know what the rules are. Um, I didn't say it at the beginning, but I'm going to say it again now. Um, I, of course, washed my hands before I did any food preparation today. Make sure that you do that if you're making cocktails. I know now that the world's breaking up and we're going out and we're going to, I've suggested you get a bottle of Bacchus, go and have some fun with six of your friends staying two meters apart in a park this, this weekend if the sun's nice. Do that. It'll be absolutely fab. Make sure you wash your hands if you're doing any food. Make sure you stay safe. It's been great talking to you today. Um, enjoy some bubbles. Enjoy the celebration of lockdown gradually breaking. Um, it's been fab. I'll speak to you next week when we'll be back with three more exciting cocktails. See you later, folks.